So let's uh, let's back up and go through what we're going to hear today, because this damning testimony expected today in the House impeachment probe could be uh, could could be tough for the White House. For the first time, House investigators will hear from a White House official who was actually assigned to listen in on the phone call, the phone call at the center of the inquiry. The New York Times was first to obtain the opening statement of Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, a top Ukraine expert on the National Security Council, who is currently serving active duty in the U.S. Army. He is expected to testify that he twice reported concerns to the NSC's lead attorney, once after a July 10th meeting in Washington between then National Security Advisor John Bolton and his Ukrainian counterpart, and attended by Ambassadors Kurt Volker and Gordon Sundland. According to Vindland, Bolton cut the meeting short when Sundland started to speak about Ukraine delivering specific investigations in order to secure a meeting between the two presidents. The opening statement continues. Following this meeting, there was a scheduled debriefing during which Ambassador Sundland emphasized the importance that Ukraine deliver the investigations into the 2016 election, the Bidens and Burisma. I stated to Ambassador Sundland that his statements were inappropriate, that the request to investigate Biden and his son had nothing to do with national security, and that such investigations were not something the NSC was going to get involved in or push. Vindland says the second time he reported concerns was after he listened in on the July 25th phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky of Ukraine. Vindland is expected to tell lawmakers, quote, I did not think it was proper to demand that a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen, and I was worried about the implications for the U.S. government's support of Ukraine. I realized that if Ukraine pursued an investigation into the Bidens and Burisma, it would likely be interpreted as a partisan play which would undoubtedly result in Ukraine losing the bipartisan support it has thus far maintained. This would all undermine U.S. national security. I will say once again, yeah. the second or third time now this has happened with these career diplomats, these patriots mm -hmm. coming forward with what they saw and heard. With what they saw, and again, we're talking. it's so important to remember, we're wow. talking about one of the most beleaguered countries in all of Europe that's been invaded by Vladimir Putin already. Mm -hmm. and, and there were threats that the invasion would continue to go westward toward Kiev. So we're, this is not a theoretical discussion. I mean, this was actually a country that desperately needed defensive weapons. They were in the middle of negotiations on, on, on releasing prisoners. They're in the middle of negotiations on how they move forward without war. Yeah. And those defensive weapons that Donald Trump was holding up and that his administration was holding up were critically needed to keep Ukraine democratic and free. And yet Donald Trump was willing alive. Uh, and to keep people alive. Uh, uh, that, uh, that horrible uh, scene uh, looking over the bridge, knowing that people would die because those weapons weren't coming. Uh, so, you know, James Fellows, this is, I will say, one blessing of the Trump administration is that at the very least, it has provided us with some clarifying moments, clarifying <laughs> moments as to the nature underlying nature of political parties. I am no longer a Republican. And the underlying nature of, of, of career civil servants and also people that we may not agree with ideologically. And I, 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 I mentioned John Bolton, who here, once again, we have an example of John Bolton calling it into a meeting, talking to his people, saying, Hey, wow. we're not going to be a part of this drug deal. Go talk to lawyers immediately. And whether it was John Bolton or the lieutenant colonel or Bill Taylor, there are still Americans that serve this government of all ideological stripes who actually put their country first. 
Uh, I agree. It's been fascinating in the past week, in the past six months or so, to see, as you say, on the one hand, both career civil servants, military people, intelligence world people, State Department people who say, I've been here before this era. I think this is right. This is wrong. I'm going to stand up for what I think is right and call out what I think is wrong, even if it means I'm going to be personally jeopardized, I might lose my job, et cetera. We're seeing that also now from some people who are more politically involved, like uh, Ambassador Mr. Bolton would be certainly the, the clearest example. I think there's no foreign policy issue on which I personally have agreed with him, maybe ever, but I really uh, respect the way that he was standing up for his, what he thought was the, the duty of, of, uh, of somebody in his job. On the other extreme, we have this daily calculation of what, if anything, will finally exceed the elasticity of the GOP Senate to rationalize away the new news of each day. You know, back in the Watergate era, there was a sense that finally there was more than the Republican Senate, than the senators would swallow. There was John Dean's mm -hmm. testimony. There was Alexander Butterfield about the taping in the White House. And presumably, there will be some point at which this, you know, the stretching and stretching and stretching of the GOP and the Senate might finally reach its bursting point. But I'm not sure that it would be rash to, to assume that even this is that stretching point, even though it's more than what John Dean said or what Alexander Butterfield said. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and, and we, we can look even beyond Congress, the Republicans in Congress, and look at what happened last night uh, when uh, the lieutenant colonel, uh, an Iraq war hero, an American patriot, uh, was accused on Fox News of, of possible uh, tr uh, treason, possible espionage. Uh, I, I want to play this real quickly and, and, and get, your, get your response, James. But get this, this is buried in the New York Times piece tonight, but I found it very interesting. Um, he's, a, he's a decorated colonel, by the way, in the Iraq war. But because Colonel Vindeman emigrated from Ukraine, along with his family when he was a child and is fluent in Ukrainian and Russian, Ukrainian officials sought advice from him about how to deal with Mr. Giuliani, though they typically communicated in English. Now, wait a second, John. <laughs> Here we have a U.S. national security official who is advising Ukraine while working inside the White House, apparently against the president's interest, and usually they spoke in English. Isn't that kind of an interesting angle on this story? I find that astounding, and you know, some people might call that espionage. Oh my God! <laughs> the the, the, idi the wow. idiocy, James. I mean, first of all, uh, to, to our, our our gentle viewers uh, from Fox News, um, Albert Einstein immigrated, I believe, from Germany and helped the United States of America win World War II. Another thing, unlike Germany during World War II, Ukraine is a democratic ally. And what helps Ukraine helps the United States of America. But, but James, it, 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 is, it is breathtaking, it is astounding that an Iraqi war veteran, a hero, a man who got injured, had a purple, got a purple heart and continued to fight for this country and work for this country after his service in Iraq, is now being accused of espionage by John Yu and Fox News hosts? <laughs> Uh, yes, and I can think of only two moments in history this, this calls to mind. One, of course, is Joseph McCarthy in his final right. days, having his final uh, showdown, you know, having you no sense of decency of when he finally attacked the army, and that was too much. The other was during the 2016 campaign, when then-candidate Trump was going against John McCain. He was going against the Kaiser uh, Khan family of just, you know, who had lost their son in combat for this nation's flag. So, again, you think at some point the cumulative weight of this attack on people who have risked their lives for the nation's welfare and protection. You hope that will pile up at some point, but uh, we can't count on that in any given day. Gosh. So Jean Robinson, the implication, it was an implication, she was just saying it there, is that this colonel who has a purple heart for 
suffering injuries in an IED attack in Iraq is somehow a double agent working for Ukraine. I'll let everyone sit on that for a minute, but let's talk about the content of what Colonel Vindman said here and what he's going to testify to today. Put this together with everything. If you didn't believe your own eyes when you read the White House summary of that phone call that put out by the White House between President Trump and President Zelensky, if you didn't believe the whistleblower report for some reason, if you didn't believe the text messages, if you didn't believe the testimony of Fiona Hill or the statement of Bill Taylor that we all read, here again we have a document corroborating exactly what you all know believed, which is that the president traded on his position and his power and used almost $400 million of military aid to seek aid from Ukraine in going after one of his political opponents. There's a cloud of disinformation being put out there. There's attacks on the sources and what about this guy? Maybe he's a double agent. Push all that to the side and just read the testimony that you have in front of you. You know what happened here. Yeah, the facts are clear, and they're really not in dispute. As you said, this is somebody who was on the phone call. He is not the whistleblower. Uh, he he uh, he refers to that um, uh, to a, a, a campaign, uh, really that lasted some time. This was an ongoing effort um, by the, by Gordon Sondland and uh, and Rudy Giuliani and and the president and presumably others of his toadies to uh, to to muscle Ukraine into into digging up dirt on Joe Biden. I mean, this is and and he he, um, uh, he found it shocking. Vindman found it shocking. He, he describes a, a time at, uh, a meeting at which um, I, uh, John Bolton cut off the meeting after Gordon Sondland started raising the the quid pro quo for these investigations of, of the Bidens. It's just astounding. Uh, you know, uh, Republican senators uh, up on Capitol Hill are starting to retreat. Um, uh, they have nothing to say. What can they say in defense of this? So they're starting to retreat behind the, well, I can't comment. I'm going to be a juror. Um, that probably sounds ominous to ears in the White House, actually, um, which would like to have Republicans defending the, defending the president on substance, and there is no defense. I happen to see Speaker Pelosi up on Capitol Hill yesterday, and I'll, and I'll tell you, she is uh, as determined and as confident um, uh, as, as she could possibly be. You recall, she didn't want to do this. She didn't want to do impeachment. She feels it was thrust on her and thrust on the country that the Times have found her um, and found uh, 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 the House of Representatives and, and laid out its duty, and she's going to do that duty. You know, Mike Barnacle, it is really something that uh, Nancy Pelosi has all of the, the mistakes that uh, we Republicans made when, uh, when I was in Congress. We'd always lurch. We'd always move quickly. Well, something seemed wrong here, so we'd, lure, we'd go quickly. And parties have been doing that. Political parties have been doing that for years. Nancy Pelosi proves once again that she's the most effective speaker since probably Sam Rayburn in that Nancy has allowed the facts of the case to catch up and go ahead of the conference before she started talking about an impeachment inquiry. And by the time she went there, public support for an impeachment inquiry was over 50 percent. So she moved forward and in doing so, taking her time, she protected her members, especially in all of those swing districts in Virginia to California. Now we have Nancy Pelosi going to an impeachment vote. She let the Republicans make fools of themselves. They even broke the law. Let them have their little pizza party look like something out of Animal House, humiliate themselves. And she let the facts reach to a point where she could then go ahead, call the vote, and in so doing, call their bluff. And so you have the majority leader or, or the minority leader of the House who Donald Trump, what's his name, Mike, Steve? Steve. Steve. They call him. Uh, now suddenly they're, Kev. they're enraged. They're right. enraged that she's having a vote on the impeachment inquiry. It's too late. We can't vote for this. The whole system's corrupt. You're, and so. Good Lord. She lets them argue process. She gets them out on a limb and then she saws the limb off. It is really <laughs> about as brilliant uh, uh, leadership as I have seen in Washington in quite some time. Joe, I don't think there's been as skillful uh, uh, a leader 
in the uh, House of Representatives, probably since Tip O'Neill, when he was majority leader, not speaker, steered the ship of Congress uh, through the Nixon impeachment proceedings when Carl Albert was reticent about it. Nancy Pelosi has taken the lead and her, has her hands on the, on, the, on the old steering wheel, and she is moving this thing in such a way and in such a direction that the Republicans clearly don't have any idea of how to deal with her. And Sam, what Joe was just talking about, all the, the way they deal with it is a level of hypocrisy that is sometimes stunning. I don't know what to say about the clip we just showed of, uh, of Laura Ingram uh, basically saying that, uh, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Finn was, uh, was guilty of espionage. But the entire cast of characters, Lindsey Graham, the hypocrisy involved in this process is kind of amazing. Yeah, I mean, we could walk through it again. The, a lot of the talking points have now been blown up. The idea that this, there was going to be no vote to start the impeachment proceeding. There now is going to be a vote. The idea that it was all hearsay, which Lindsey Graham was one of the first to champion, that the whistleblower account was just hearsay, so you couldn't trust it. We now have someone on the call. Uh, the idea that there was no quid pro quo, uh, we've gotten several people now to establish that there was, in fact, a quid pro quo. I mean, <laughs> Mick Mulvaney was one of them. Uh, and now the talking point is that, well, this is no different than what Democrats were doing in Ukraine, trying to ensure that Ukrainian leadership wasn't standing in the way of the investigators from the Mueller probe. So the, the goalposts are being moved. The question I keep coming back to is, what is the alternative for the Republican Party in this situation? I'm not sure there is an alternative. If the facts are this damning, then you do end up having to argue process. And the entire hope was that if you could shame these people and bully them into not testifying, if you could throw up enough legal hurdles that they refuse to go to the Hill at all, then maybe you could suffocate the entire thing. Uh, but that's proven to be not the case. Uh, people are coming forward, uh, sometimes at risk of their own reputation, in this case, uh, decorated Purple Heart veteran uh, being accused of espionage. And I think what that ends up having, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, is a cascading effect, which is you, people go out there, they say their piece, and then others are going to say, well, if that's their, you know, I want to get my version of the events out, uh, maybe, maybe it's worth getting ahead of this train. And so if I'm in the White House, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, I need a new game plan because this is simply not working. And so, guys, if you look at the testimony that we're going to see from Colonel Vin and Joe and Mika today, again at the center of it is Ambassador Gordon Sunland. Gordon Sunland is the ambassador to the EU. He has no purview of what was happening in Ukraine, but again and again, he's seen at the center of this, along with Rudy Giuliani, running effectively a shadow foreign policy. And Colonel Vinman gets into some detail about that. Gordon Sunland, again, to remind everyone, is a hotel guy whose companies gave a million dollars to President Trump's inaugural committee, so he was appointed ambassador to the EU. He, the hotel guy who gave money to Donald Trump, is running a shadow foreign policy, and he may have just run President Trump into an impeachment. Well, he, 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 he may have done it. It's and, looking likely. You know, it's, it's interesting, James Fellows, that this, this character, uh, Ambassador Sondland was a guy that went around with very sharp elbows. He would show up unannounced to meetings, call himself the ambassador to Europe, <laughs> which, of course, there is no ambassador to Europe, while, while, doing, while others were scurrying around trying to do work in places like Poland. He would just drop in, then demand private jets back to, 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 to Brussels or, or other parts of Europe. And so made very few friends, uh, but, but believed that he was empowered uh, to, to do whatever he wanted to do because of Donald Trump. But what's so fascinating is that even he appears to be getting a little wobbly yeah. in the knees because even he is starting to understand how serious this is and how it may go downhill. Do you suspect that uh, his testimony by the end may be perhaps the most fascinating, because I know he has a wife already talking about how this is hurting their business. Uh, it, that, that certainly is a possibility. I think any of us who has worked in politics has seen characters like this over the years. They attach themselves to almost every campaign, and there's been more latitude for them in the, in the Trump campaign. I've been thinking of one other historical comparison, which was the first Watergate, uh, the, the previous uh, two, two impeachments back with Nixon and, and Watergate. And, and it, it, it's actually one, something that's similar is that the Republicans held together for longer than you would think. 
in retrospect in the face of uh, the mounting evidence and trying to say, yes, we're staying with, with our president. One difference then was that Richard Nixon was a much more formidable person than uh, as a policy person than Donald Trump. A second is there was no Fox News to kind of ram home the message every single day. But there was this same similarity where once people started to move at the very end, it wasn't a gradual move. It was one moved and then about 50 more did within the next couple of days. And so I think that that is more like the dynamic one might see here for a very, very long time, the rationalization, uh, then, then if somebody starts to move, then many people might move. Agreed. All right. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.